All right. Let's get started today. So I hope that the, uh, the administrative TA that does all the grading, uh, that's separate from the discussion TAs, that he will be done with the grading soon of the second midterm. Um, I'll, I'll inquire today how far he's along. Um, and just um, in terms of the schedule, uh, Thursday there's no class because I'll go to a conference and won't be here. Uh, we'll have another class next week, Tuesday, but then that, Thursday, that following Thursday, of course, is Thanksgiving, right? So, and then the week after that, we have two more classes, and then the quarter is done. Um, so again, so put in your calendar, and there's no class this coming Thursday. Any other questions before we start? All right, so today we'll talk about, um, well, the last part of language. Um, two very different topics. First, language and animals, which gets a little bit of attention in the book, but I want to expand uh, on it a bit more. And then the connection between uh, language and thought. So first we'll talk about um, this issue of, of are we unique as humans in our ability to learn a language. And there's some controversy about it. Um, there's differences in opinion uh, among researchers uh, about the extent to which animals can display sort of linguistic capabilities. Uh, but it's also fair to say that the, um, the boundaries are shifting gradually. We're starting to realize through clever experiments and training experiments that animals are more capable than, than we gave them credit for. And we'll talk about three amazing examples. Uh, uh, Chaser, a border collie, uh, Alex the parrot, and uh, Kanzi and Nim Chimsky. And Nim Chimsky, of course, being a clever wordplay on Noam Chomsky. Um, and then in the second part, we'll talk about the connection between language and thought. Um, how closely connected is, is our language, the way we use words, the way we use linguistic constructions, our specific language, and our thinking? Um, how, is, that, is that a very tight connection where language really shapes all of our thinking? Um, and is it pervasive? Does language shape all of our thinking, including our perception? Or uh, is it less tight than, than some people, including Worf, uh, hypothesize? So we'll talk about the Worfian hypothesis. So first, do animals have language? Um, and this is a tricky question, and you get immediately lots of differences in opinion. And part of the uh, issue is here, uh, what do we mean by language, right? So if the question really is about, do animals have an ability to communicate using language? The answer has to be yes, of course. Uh, there are lots of examples. Um, where animals use call signals to communicate effectively about upcoming or nearby predators. Uh, a good example are vervet, vervet monkeys. They have uh, different alarm calls, different acoustic uh, alarm calls for, I think it was leopard, bonobo, python, and eagle. Um, and they distinguish between all these different predators. They have different ways of escaping these predators. And these signals are used very effectively uh, among uh, vervet monkeys. Vervet monkeys even know uh, when somebody is not very reliable in terms of signaling predators, then that vervet monkey will be ignored. Um, now the tricky question, and this is where uh, there's less agreement about, is, is to what extent do animals have the ability to form complex linguistic representations? including syntax, right? So um, to what degree do animals have the capability to form combinatorial sequences uh, that is not just choosing a bunch of chunks, choosing a bunch of words, but also how you put the chunks and the words together, 
the order of those chunks, that that matters, that that can lead to different meaning. And a lot of researchers, including Noam Chomsky, that we talked about previously, would say, no, animals are not capable of language in that, in that fashion. Uh, Noam Chomsky is a nativist, so he argues that, uh, along with more recent researchers like Steven Pinker, uh, they argue for a strong, strong biological basis of language, human language. So they argue that um, there are a specific set of genes that humans have, animals don't have it, and with those genes, uh, you build a certain brain, and that brain, the human brain, has a capability of perceiving complex combinatorial sequences and producing those sequences uh, using various rules. And animals, according to them, simply don't have that genetic makeup, so they can't have complex linguistic representations. But we'll see that the, the lines are blurring a little bit. Uh, there's some very interesting examples, compelling examples, I think, where animals do pretty amazing things. So first, um, Chase of the Border Collie. So um, historically, a lot of uh, animal language research has focused on the great apes because they're considered uh, intuitively as highly intelligent. But more recently, um, dogs have been used as well for training. And the idea is that dogs are extremely eager to learn. Uh, they pay attention to humos, humans, whereas bonobos, uh, you know, apes that uh, are considered highly intelligent, they're often using language learning experiments, they don't care as much about humans. Uh, so there's this uh, professor, Professor John Piley, he spent three years, uh, four or five hours a day of training this dog chaser to recognize uh, objects. Most of these objects are stuffed animals. Um, you'll see a clip on the next slide. So he's able to distinguish between 1,000 different words. Most of these are nouns, uh, proper nouns, like it's different nouns for this particular stuffed animal, or this bowl, or this frisbee. But there, were, there was some capability also of the dog to um, use verbs. So you, this dog knew um, that find the ball means something different from uh, knows this ball or knows this frisbee. Now there's a claim that Chaser can also recognize categories. So not just fetch this particular frisbee, uh, the dog could understand, but also fetch just a frisbee, right? The difference between an instance of a category versus um, sort of any instance, um, sort of something from a category. And I think the most amazing uh, demonstration of this dog is the principle of mutual exclusivity. So we talked about this last time. Previously, it was thought that only human children had this capability of applying the principle of mutual exclusivity, but now we know that this dog can do it as well. So remember, mutual exclusivity is, is this reasoning principle uh, where you reason by, or, or, it's a process of elimination. If you hear a new word and you don't know what it means, it probably applies to the object that you don't know and not to an object that you already know the name for. And the reasoning is if, um, if it would refer to an, an existing object, then the, pr the person would have used a name that I knew. But it's a name that I don't know, so therefore it applies to this new object. And it's a very cle clever idea that human children use to narrow down all these possibilities, all these things that words can refer to. Um, basically saying, well, it has to refer, if a new word has to refer to something I'm not familiar with. So I want to show you a clip where, in the end, it, it, it shows this principle of this reasoning by inference or mutual, mutual exclusivity. Yeah. Welcome, That's a little loud. Let's see. Let's do it again. Welcome. Beloved six year old border company of psychology professor John Hill. Good girl. He was born to live here in the Scottish Mountains. Hey, go, go, go. And her cheap. Go, go. John has taught Chaser to tend an extremely large and unconventional bird. 
of a thousand toys. <laughs> and she knows the name of every single one of these? I hope. <laughs> I find it hard to believe, so I test Chaser's memory with a random sampling. Chaser, find Inky. Well, she got one right. Find Seal. Whoa! <laughs> and that one too. In fact, she got all nine right. But what about a new toy she's never seen or heard the name of? Chaser's never seen Barbara, hasn't even ever heard the name of. So we're going to see if she picks out Darwin by his friends. Find Darwin. I have to ask her again. Okay, Chaser. Chaser, Chaser, Chaser. Find Darwin. Darwin! That's Darwin! She did it! Chaser's never seen her. Yeah, so what he mentioned, deduction or inference, that's that idea of mutual exclusivity. Now, another example, um, very, very impressive uh, example of language learning in animals is, is Alex de Parrot. Um, so Alex was... Uh, bought at some local pet store by Dr. Pepperberg in 1977 and trained his bird uh, for over 30 years. Many, many hours a day for 30 years. So it's an immense amount of training. And of course, these gray parrots, they have the advantage of being able to vocalize human speech. They don't vocalize the way we vocalize. They, do, they produce sounds, human sounding words in quite a different way, but still, that's, that's a nice ability of, of, of these parrots. And this parrot was particularly clever and developed a vocabulary of over 50 words. And those words included color words, but also more abstract words, like number words. And um, also relative concepts like smaller versus bigger. And Dr. Pepperberg uh, um, argued that this um, bird was able to answer very complex questions about the world. So in this example uh, over here, uh, the bird is able to answer how many red blocks are on this, on this tray or how many blue blocks are on this tray. Now, uh, the controversy here is whether this bird really has this um, capability to, to think abstractly and to reason abstractly about new situations, or whether the bird was simply reinforced you know, over decades of training to do certain things, to basically imitate uh, the trainer. And it's hard to disentangle this. You know, when is something based on operant conditioning, learning by reinforcement, and when is something truly novel? Uh, when, when can this animal generalize to new situations and answer sort of arbitrarily complex questions? So I want to show you an example of, of uh, some of these things that, that, that Alex can do. And Alex, by the way, is this uh, acronym that stands for Avian Learning Experiment. Um, That's right. You're a good Alex can answer different questions about the same object. How many cards? What shape? What shape? Four. Four. Four corner. Good boy. Alex hasn't just learned to say a certain word when he says a particular How object. Many? He's How paying many? attention to the questions. How many? Green block. How many green blocks? Look on 
This is an interesting problem. Alex can't just count up all the green things, and he can't just count up all the blocks. Alex has never been trained with this particular collection of things. How many green blocks? Good parent, two green blocks, two good parents. One of the things Alex doesn't have is a knee-jerk response to the types of objects that he presents him. He can look at two objects and answer several different types of questions about those objects, or he can look at a novel collection of items and answer questions about that collection. What this shows us is that he really understands what those questions mean. Right, but other researchers would disagree with her. Um, other researchers would say, mm, there's a lot of training that went on here. There was a lot of reinforcement, a lot of operant conditioning. And you know, how do we know for sure that some of these displays are really new? Uh, maybe it's a very similar displays we used before. And the parrot was simply reinforced for giving the right answer. And it's tough to do the, um, to do the independent research or, or to do the sort of independent sort of control experiments because she had this bond with this parrot. So only she was able to do uh, some of these, these follow-up experiments. And yeah, some researchers would, would say mm, the proper research hasn't been done here to truly know uh, whether the parrot can generalize to new situations. Now, the vast majority of, of animal language research has been conducted um, uh, with non-human primates. Um, and so the early experiments uh, with uh, mostly chimpanzees were disastrous. Uh, so initially, families were adopting uh, infant chimpanzees uh, that were growing up along with human uh, children in some nice, loving, and caring family household. And the idea was, well, um, maybe we can uh, train these uh, these chimpanzees to learn to produce uh, human speech. And in some of these examples, some of these chimpanzees indeed were able to vocalize a few human sounds, like saying mama. Uh, but the most, uh, the, the most number of words was about four or five or so. Uh, chimpanzees simply don't have the vocal tract uh, to produce sounds in a human uh, fashion. So after these disastrous initial experiments, uh, people switched to uh, either sign language or devices uh, like the lexigram, um, where the uh, chimpanzee or bonobo learns uh, that certain symbols on this display, they, they refer to concepts. So in this lexigram, um, you can touch some of these symbols. It's a little bit like an early iPad, if you will. And then uh, uh, the corresponding English word is, is pronounced. So some of these symbols might mean banana. If you touch it, it would say banana. And the idea is that then the uh, bonoba can learn the connection between some symbol, some arbitrary symbol, and the English word. Now, Kanzi actually uh, was not. Um, intentionally taught this, this uh, language. Uh, it happened to be an accident uh, that they discovered that Kanzi could, could handle this lexigram. Kanzi grew up with his mother, uh, who was the, the true sort of um, objective of the experiment. And the mother was already an adult and did never learn to deal with this lexigram. But Kanzi, as an infant, was observing what his mother was doing. And presumably, because he was still in his sensitive period or critical period of language learning, uh, was able to learn through observation uh, what some of these symbols refer to, and that these symbols, you know, that there's a that there's a uh, linguistic pattern. And so, Kanzi can distinguish between 256 words uh, on this display, and uh, was able to understand human speech uh, by learning the association between the sounds and the symbols. So um, the most impressive demonstration is where Kanzi is asked to, um, to follow up on certain, certain commands, um, where these are commands that have never been used before. Uh, these are novel sentences. 
And the test is whether Kanzi can understand the construction of these novel sentences. So here I'll play a video clip, and you'll see a researcher using a mask. Um, and the mask is simply used to, um, um, to mask the human um, facial expressions that sometimes can give away the answer. Uh, animals are very clever at it's sort of picking up on facial expressions. So pretty impressive. Um, all these odd commands are used because the argument is that these are commands that uh, Kanzi has never been exposed to or uh, asked about before. So Kanzi definitely has some rudimentary abilities uh, to understand syntax, right? So some of these commands involved nouns and verbs, prepositions, right? And Kanzi did make some sense out of these, these questions. And in follow-up experiments, um, Kanzi was actually able to distinguish uh, between uh, two sentences with the same words but in different orders, uh, word orders. So make the doggy bite the snake or make the snake bite the doggy. Kanzi actually did um, discriminate between these two different uh, commands. So, uh, a harder issue is, does Kanzi really understand reference? Uh, that's another um, ability that some nativist linguists, linguists like Noam Chomsky argue that animals don't have. Um, so when Kanzi learns the word banana, what, what does that mean? Um, when we talk about reference, uh, a, a reference is an ability to refer to things even when they're not there, right? You can talk, we can talk about bananas even when they're not in view. But it's unclear if Kanzi can uh, or ha have reference like this. It seems that um, these words were always used to refer to specific instantiations. Um, like I want a banana to eat, here's a picture of banana, there's a picture of banana. But it's unclear if Kanzi really understood the abstract concept uh, of a banana. Um, and some uh, researchers that originally did this, this, the training with, with Kanzi and other uh, great apes, they were very disappointed because they, uh, they never saw sort of interesting new constructions coming up from these, uh, from these animals that, that demonstrated use of, of intentionality or reference. The other um, sort of disappointing aspect of animal language in, uh, in, in chimpanzees um, is their productions. So there's one uh, chimpanzee called Nim Chimsky, 
again, this wordplay of Noam Chomsky, that was taught sign language. And if you look at the frequent um, sentences produced by Nim Chimsky, it seems very repetitive, and it doesn't show a lot of combinatorial complexity. Like, eat, drink, eat, drink, banana, nim, banana, nim, banana, eat me, nim, banana, me, eat, banana. Um, and in fact, the longest utterance ever produced by Nim Chimsky it really means something quite simple. Um, so give orange, me, give, eat, orange, me, eat, orange, give, me, eat, orange, give me you. Um, just give me the orange. Um, but it seems to be composed of a whole bunch of chunks and then arbitrarily thrown together. Uh, this researcher, Yang, uh, looked at the productions from Nim and looked at the productions of a human child and concluded that Nim's productions don't really, are not really compatible with a combinatorial system uh, where word order matters. Uh, these are just, again, like chunks thrown together in arbitrary ways. So to conclude about this uh, part on animals and language, uh, animals definitely can communicate using language and are quite effective. Uh, but this, the language that they use often lacks some syntax. Uh, they don't quite capture uh, reference. And the vocabulary size is quite limited. Uh, I mean, think about a human child. Uh, a five, six-year-old knows about roughly 10,000 words. And there's no animal that has anything uh, approximating this size of a vocabulary. Also, these animals, they were trained over a very long time span. Um, in, in Alex the Parrot's case, it was over three decades, whereas a human child learns in a few years. Um, you know, some pr pretty impressive um, language skills. So this has led to some researchers like Steven Pinker, Noam Chomsky, and many others to say there's something special about human language. It has to point to some role of biology, and some say, therefore, it has to, there has to be a role of genetics. There's some complex set of genes. If you have those genes, your brain is designed in a way to, to be capable of, of forming combinatorial sequences. But we have no understanding whatsoever what those genes would be and how, how they operate um, to, to make language, complex language learning possible. So any comment or question about this? All right. So then moving on to the, uh, the next topic, language and thought. So Sapir Worf is a researcher um, after who we know the, the, the Worf hypotheses, and he um, proposed that the way we use language, our particular language, uh, that that strongly influences our thinking. And his view is quite extreme. He says our language is our thinking. Um, so if you believe in Worf's hypothesis, you would also claim that speakers of different languages, they will perceive the world differently. The particular words that you use to, to refer to things or to, think, to refer to abstract concepts, if you have those words, then you can think about those concepts. But according to Worf, if you don't have those words, right, because some languages are different, then you can't think about that concept. That's the extreme uh, position here. And it's, it's a little odd. So Worf claims sort of a causal connection where the language causes us to think in a certain way. But many other researchers, they would say that's exactly the, the, the wrong way around. It's really the world and our perception of the world causes our language over long-term uh, learning. So there's two versions of the Worf hypothesis that, that people have looked at. The strong version that really nobody really believes in is that language determines our thinking. Um, if you don't have a word to describe an experience, you can't think about it. The weak version is more interesting. Uh, language influences our thinking and all aspects of our thinking, including perception. 
if you have a certain word to refer to something out there in the world that helps you to perceive it. So we'll talk about two experiments. I'll talk about one experiment in great detail. Uh, how does our vocabulary or vocabulary words influence our perception of color? And the second experiment is now how does our language for spatial position and direction, how does it affect our spatial memory? So first about color perception. Um, here's some uh, Moncel color chips, as they're called, that vary along uh, brightness and hue, right? Think about sort of paint samples you get at a uh, paint store. And many different people from different cultures, different linguistic backgrounds have been asked to categorize these color chips, put them in different piles, and then apply a label uh, to, those, to those chips. And in these experiments, you can sort these in, in any, pile, not any number of piles that you want and use any number of labels that you want. Now, English, speaking, uh, English speakers, they tend to divide up these color chips in this way. There are essentially eight color words, basic color words, uh, right, as, as, as is shown in the bottom. And the piles that people create um, correspond to these um, uh, regions uh, corresponding to the upper, upper graph. So the greenish colors, of course, are called green, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we, can have, we, we have more color words than just green and blue and purple. But if you ask people, how would you sort this out? This is the way people sort it out. Now, what's really interesting is that uh, people uh, with a different linguistic background, different cultural background, they might actually come up with quite different set of color terms and use different boundaries uh, in this color space. So the members of the Barinmo tribe in New Guinea, they only use five basic color categories. <coughs> They might have more complex ways to divvy up colors, but these are the five that they talk about, just like English talks mostly about eight, eight color words. And you can see here, this is a big um, chunk of colors, greenish colors and bluish colors, they're all called null. The reds are about the same as English. And then there are some um, colors called war. And this includes some orange colors, some yellow, and some green colors as well. They're all lumped together under war. So again, just side by side, uh, the Barinmo tribe has this way of carve up the uh, color world, and the English um, speakers carve it up uh, as shown in below. So the question is, what consequences does this have for color perception? Does, does it matter what, what labels you use? And what's really uh, of interest is those colors that fall across different boundaries. So if, if you have a color that we call green and a color that we would normally call blue, what would a person from the Barimbo tribe process these colors as? Um, would that person, because that person doesn't have a, a normal color words to distinguish between the two because they're all both called null, would that person not perceive those differences as well? So, the question here is, um, what, what is the perception of these colors that fall across these color boundaries as defined by the, the color terms? And what happens with the color terms that fall within uh, one of these uh, color boundaries that belong to the same category? If you're a Warfian, you would say that matters a great deal. But other researchers say, no, the, we, we all have the same visual system. Um, and the visual system is not influenced uh, by the language that we learn. So we should see no difference in color perception. So an experiment was done. And in this experiment, there were color pairs that were falling within category in English, let's say greenish colors that for the Barinmo tribe would fall across categories, right? Some greenish color would be called war, 
and another greenish color would be called null. And some color words that are across category for English, like a green versus blue, would be within category for the Brunro uh, people. So the question is, do we see evidence of, uh, of these languages uh, leading to, to different color perceptions? So here's an experiment. So in this experiment, um, subjects were studying one of these colors for a later memory test. So there was a 30 second delay and then they were given a two alternative force choice task. They had to say, which one of these two test colors is the target, right? And they're supposed to say this one, that's the target, that's the one I've seen before. Now, this happens to be one of those pair that, that would be called the same thing for Burinmo speaker, it would both be called no. So this, this will be within category for them. Now, in another trial, they might see a different color chip. And here, they might have to um, decide, you know, is this a target or is this a target for memory, right? This is no longer on the screen. Uh, and this happens to be a cross category example. This would be called null, this would be called war. So what do the results show? Amazingly, the results show that English speakers they are better, they are better at these pairs, which are a cross category for us, and worse at these pairs. And for the Burinmo speakers, it's the other way around. They are better at this pair, and, or they are, sorry, they are better at this pair and worse at this pair, because what's within a cross category is reversed for them. So that seems to suggest there's, there's evidence for this Worf hypothesis your color terms influence your perception. But the problem is, uh, it affects something, but is it really perception? Or is there something else going on? So one possible strategy that people could use is they see that this color chip coming up and they, they desperately try to hold on to this memory, this visual memory, for a later test. So one thing you could do is just use the label and silently rehearse the label to yourself to hold on to this, this, this very rapidly fading visual memory. So they are not just perceiving the colors better or worse, they're just using strategies to remember the information. So the, in this experiment there was a control condition to test this possibility. They wanted to eliminate the effect of verbal encoding. So in one condition, subjects were asked to rehearse certain color words out loud. And that really interferes with your strategy of, of holding on to this, this, this color words because you're constantly using color words to describe something else. And there was another control condition, a visual interference condition, where subjects looked at a, a multicolored dot pattern. And this is just a control for difficulty. Um, that you know, maybe if you make something more difficult, then performance uh, suffers, and maybe that explains things. So here are the results. Um, so first, if there's no interference, the finding is that this condition is better than this condition. So the red square is the, uh, those are the results for the between category identification, which is better than within category identification. Now, if you start doing this visual interference, so you make the task harder, and you see performance goes down for both conditions. But you still see this advantage for the between category identification. Now, the key result is over here. If you ask people to rehearse color words out loud, then the advantage of the between category distinction goes away. Right? Subjects are as good with colors if they can be described by the same word or different words, it doesn't matter. And this strongly suggests that people were using a verbal encoding strategy when trying to remember these, these colors. So the conclusion from this experiment is that um, language definitely has an effect on the way we remember information, right? 
but it does not seem to affect very low level cognitive processes, or it doesn't seem to affect how we perceive things. Right? Our thinking consists of multiple stages. There's, uh, there's perceiving, and there's memory, and decision making, problem solving. And language definitely influences all those higher stages, but not the lower stages of information processing. Does that experiment make sense to you? OK, now one more experiment um, relates to spatial position and spatial frames of reference. So um, if you look at these two visual displays, A and B, and you have to describe the location of the bowl relative to the table, then in English, you'll be forced to describe this very differently. Um, so if I say the bowl is blank, the table, what would you fill in for the blank here? What preposition would you use? The bowl is above the table. The bowl is blank, the table. What, would you, what preposition would you use? It feels like you have to use those different prepositions, right? Now, I don't speak Korean or Japanese, but some of you might. Is there anybody that can help me out? Would you, let me ask it as a question. Would you, as a, somebody with a Korean, uh, la Japanese language background, describe these two situations in very similar terms? Anybody willing to speak up? No? <laughs> well, if, if I did my homework correctly, um, in Korean and Japanese, you would have some construction what, like bowl is on top of for display A, and a similar construction, bowl is on top of for B. You can use more words, you can use verbs and adverbs to make the distinction if you want to. You can say something that in A it's floating, it's floating top of table, and the, uh, in B you could say something like it's B on or it's sticking um, bowl top of, but it's not mandatory. And that's, that's the key point uh, in this experiment. For English speakers, this distinction is mandatory. Uh, you have to use different prepositions, but not so in Korean and Japanese. So the question that these researchers asked is, because it's mandatory to make this contact of, make, make contact with and make not contact with, because that's mandatory in, in English, do English speakers see differences um, more when something makes contact versus not, relative to Korean and Japanese speakers. So they did an ex experiment, very similar to the sort of previous ex experiments. They see, um, subjects see a visual display for a very brief, brief amount of time. And then this, there's a mask. And then there's another display where this bowl might be in a slightly different position. And sometimes it might make contact with the table or not. And the question is, if subjects have to make this same different discrimination, would English speakers notice it more if, in one case, the bowl makes contact with the table and in another case it doesn't? Well, the answer is very simple. Um, there's no distinction between English speakers and Japanese Korean speakers in making these perceptual discriminations. Everybody's about the same. Um, so the warfing prediction is not upheld here. The language for spatial terms does not influence your, your spatial memory. Uh, the way you perceive these things is just the same. So overall, there's a lot of researchers that have looked into this issue of, of the connection between language and thought, uh, hoping to find some causal connection between how the language that we know and grew up with, how that can affect our thinking all the way down to perception. And it's clear that there is some influence. Um, you do think differently in some language than another language. But it, it's not the case that that influences our low level perception. Uh, we find no evidence of that. Uh, some people are better perceiving things than others, but that seems quite orthogonal to the language uh, that we use. Let's see, and that's, that's it for today.
Um, so short lecture today. And um, oh, and one more thing. I'll, I'll send out a, um, a quiz later today. I haven't made it yet, but you'll get an announcement through AAA, and you'll get a week to, to complete it. Okay, I'll see you next week, Tuesday.